Okay, uh, maybe it's time to get started. So many of you already know, but for those who don't, this is David Spurgel, um, who's visiting us from Princeton and also from the uh, Center for Computational Astrophysics, where he's the new director. So that's a new institute that started up in New York City. That's very nice. That I've been happy to visit already a few times, and it's, it's really nice. Um, David's a world expert or world leader in um, many things extragalactic, particularly CMB. Um, so one thing that sticks out is the WMAP mission, uh, which he was a big part of, which was um, really the first entry into uh, precision, precision cosmology um, that many of us here in the room are, are working on. Um, he's also a big, uh, uh, really pushing forward uh, this idea of the future of ground-based CMB that a bunch of people in the room are working with him on. Um, in particular, Simon's Observatory, which is the ACT and polar bear teams coming together, um, and then into the future after that. Um, but he's not going to talk about the CMB today, it seems. Uh, today we'll hear about the W first mission. So uh, thanks very, very much, David, for coming. And also, uh, thank you to the Ismaili Center. So the, the Ismaili Center is the host for David's visit today, and so we thank them for, uh, for uh, hosting David. Thanks. And I'll be giving a popular talk, thanks, um, tonight uh, at the Ismaili Center on CMB. So I thought I would not do a CMB talk now. Um, and as I mentioned, as we were settling down, I wanted to give people an overview of W First. And there's a couple reasons for it. One, I'm co-chair of the science team. So I'm spending a chunk of my time thinking about it. Um, another is, um, you know, while this is a theoretical institution, my own experience as a theorist has been knowing where the data is going to get better often helps to find, you know, what are the interesting questions. So I think actually is it's worth keeping an eye um, on what's, you know, what's coming. And W first I view as, as you'll see, it does many things, but it's part of this next kind of generation of big survey telescopes and is very complementary to LSST and the combination should be quite powerful. And this is a, a project where, um, you know, right now there's very serious discussions between NASA and CSA, um, also with uh, Japan and Europe to come in as partners. The timing of the mission is that decision will be made by all those, uh, all those institutions within the next year or so. So it's uh, a good time for people here to, I hope, to hear about it. So what's W first? So uh, well, I'll, I'll, record, I'll tell the story away, even though I'm recorded. But, so W first was the top ranked uh, mission in the decadal survey. And it was ranked number one. It was proposed as a 1.6 meter telescope. And the idea was that the Decadal Survey had three proposals, one to study dark energy, one to do a near-infrared sky survey, and the other to do an exoplanet census that all wanted a one-meter class survey near-infrared telescope. And they felt they could accomplish all these goals with a single, uh, slightly bigger telescope. And when this... Uh, was uh, proposed at the top priority in the decadal survey, it actually did not gain that much traction. Some of it was the political timing. Some of it was the problems with JWST. Um, but a piece was it was not, I think, in some ways, a big enough step forward. And then an unusual opportunity opened up. Um, at the time this was happening, I was chair of the Astro Committee on Astronomy and Astrophysics of the National Academy. And I got a phone call from John Grunsfeld, who was uh, you know, head of science at NASA. And John said, you can't tell anyone about this, but we just got two 2.4 meter telescopes. And you know, I had felt that I had driven into some rough neighborhood, and someone from the back of a truck had said, we just got some awesome stereo speakers. They're completely legit. They don't come with a manual, but they're just what you want. And it turned out somewhat to be true. And over time, they've given us a little more information on the manual. Um, and what 
the telescope is that we've got from the National Reconnaissance Organization is a 2.4 meter telescope that is part of a canceled military program that got canceled for other reasons. Um, and it has effectively 200 times the field of view of the Hubble telescope. So, you know, I so the high level summary of what this does is you're getting Hubble quality imaging over 100 times the sky. And I think of this as combining what were two of the most successful optical telescopes of the past decade or so, the Hubble telescope and the Sloan. So it's both a great survey instrument and ha has high resolution. And we realized um, that we could use this telescope with a coronagraph and achieve contrasts of around 10 to the 9. And this picture sort of uh, conveys you know, the, basic, the sort of four basic programs planned for this. Um, a dark energy program, a microlensing program, a coronography program, and a program of uh, general astrophysics with pointed survey, where about uh, of order 20 to 25 percent of the time, probably over the mission, will be, you know, pointing at uh, particular targets. Um, though a lot of what I think of as coming out of the mission sort of for the rest of astrophysics is not just the GEO program. But while we're doing dark energy, you're surveying several thousand square degrees, um, and that's going to be, that g data will be all be available and will be very useful for lots of astrophysics problems. The microlensing data will be learning a lot about the bulge with bulge observations. And something that we've actually just begun really exploring what we get out of it, um, we have a year of chronography time where we're pointing at about 20 targets with the coronagraph. And while we do that, we're still running the wide field camera. So you actually go incredibly deep at a whole bunch of different patches around the sky. And um, there's some mild limits on filter changes and things like that. We don't want to shake the telescope at all while the coronagraph people are working. But there'll be, like, uh, the way the operations go, we think we could actually carry out some really uh, awesome deep fields across the sky. So there's sort of that high level picture of, you know, Think about doing things like the ultra deep field, where instead of getting 10,000 galaxies in an observation, you're getting a million galaxies. And that opens up a class of um, questions that uh, you can uh, look at otherwise. And here's just uh, a list again of what I put in pictures of sort of the core uh, science programs that we're looking at. I think this will work. Yes. Since this is a NASA mission, we get fun videos. So I'll just show one fun video. Um, for a long time, I wasn't allowed to show a picture of the telescope. But they've now actually declassified it. So there's actually a picture of the telescope. And having seen the telescope, um, I never understood why this was it's a 2.4 meter optical three mirror astigmat. That's not um, something surprising. Um, no, but I am actually carrying with me a brand new laptop because my next trip after this, well, I'm going to Vancouver, and then from Vancouver, I'm going to China. And I'm going to be, the Chinese are planning to fly a two meter telescope off of their space station, and I'm on their international advisory committee. And it was made clear to me by people that I do not want to go to China with my laptop, because even though I have nothing on it, given that I work on this project and I'm co chair of the science team, you know, and given, you know, the actions of the Chinese government. Um, you, play, you, you go with a clean laptop and a clean phone, and when you return, you, you don't, uh, you, you erase it. So I, will, I will, be, will be careful with my emails. I will have a special email account only for China. So 
that, that, that they should be happy with me. I'm, I'm doing prop, proper security. For Canada, I played it loose. <laughs> the, you know, City Island. Every time I go to City Island, they always somehow, it must be bored, they like ask me a whole bunch of random questions. This time they were like asking me, are you sure you've not answered, entered Canada under a pseudonym? <laughs> <laughs> and they want to know how many times in my life have I been to Canada? And that was a hard question. I mean, if it's, a, you know, it's like, well, how many times I visit CETA and this and that? Oh yeah, what about those ski trips? Anyway. <laughs> I guess, yeah. I, I, I woke I just, I, I, I'm, I think they're just really bored at City Island. I don't, I don't think they have many terrorists coming through. OK, back to W first. Um, so basically think of this as we've got this wide field in, um, imager, 18.84 um, RGs. This is sort of the key uh, technology for the camera. These are you know, big infrared detectors. Um, we're now at the stage where um, these are meeting all our tests. They'll do uh, what we want. One of the nice things about this new generation of infrared detectors is for those people who've w heard or followed these things, oh, infrared detectors have had a lot of problems with persistence. So you look at data from Spitzer, it remembers where it looked last. And if you're trying to do precision work with things like lensing, that's a real problem. And the level of persistence we're seeing um, for these new generation of detectors is much lower. They've gotten much better at building these things. And then I'll talk more in detail about the coronagraph. So right now we're at a stage with the program where we have what we're calling a formulation science working group. So we have science teams, and their job is to design observing programs that are used to specify the hardware. But this is not, we will have another competition, and the plan is when we do this, we will have teams competing that will be drawn not just from the US, but US plus our international partners um, that will come up with the observing plans. So, for example, one where I think we have a lot of potentially interesting trade-offs is the high latitude survey. Right now we have a design of 2,227 square degrees, which sounds very specific because you need a number. Um, but we can easily make trade-offs between going much wider in fewer bands or going deeper. And I'm actually a believer in uh, we should try to make some of those decisions um, as late as possible because we will learn things um, from LSST. Um, one of the things I think we will learn from LSST is how crowded the sky is. So we at Princeton are part of Hyper Supreme Cam and we, it, with Hyper Supreme Cam we have gone to LSST depths in our ultra deep fields and when you get down to what will be, say, the LSST 10-year depth, you're, you start to get to the confusion limit. A lot of galaxies start to overlap. It becomes difficult to make measurements of things like ellipticities. And I think it's going to be very valuable to have the combination of the W first and the LSST data. So, you know. I think we may want to trade off some of this field with maybe covering 10,000 square degrees in a single band over the LSST footprint, for example, and do that in combination with this. Um, so we've got, this is optimized for uh, weak lensing work. Uh, as an observing strategy, we've gone for um, minimizing systematic errors as opposed to getting the highest figure of merit. So you would get a higher figure of merit if you only observed your lensing field. You covered as much area as possible. But the record of weak lensing work has been completely limited by systematics. And the strategy here is we are observing in three separate bands. We can do lots of cross correlations. 
And in each band, we're planning four to five dithers at different angles. So we'll have a lot of, uh, in a sense, redundancy, uh, lots and lots of null tests. And it was, it's sort of designed with that strategy um, you know, to be uh, critical of the DES papers. If you look at their results, they've come out with a result where if you take the combination of DES and Planck, the best fit value is four sigma away from W equals minus one. And it's very clear in the figures and everything. But I think they feel they don't understand their systematics well enough. It's the year one data. They, they kind of hide that and instead show all their results in combination with, you know, they take Planck plus H naught plus BAO, and then add DES, and only then re report results. Dick, you're, you're looking at me like you don't believe me. If you look at the figures, compare their numbers to the Planck numbers alone combined with those data. And you'll see that they've basically chosen external data sets that drive you to W equals minus 1. And I think of for the dark energy program here, this is the last, in some ways, of the dark energy missions we'll do. And this has got to be definitive. If, you know, if we see a result where W is different from minus 1, we want to be confident of that. And that's why we've taken this approach of you know, with the lensing, we're highly redundant. We're doing both lensing and BAO and supernova. And they'll all overlap in redshift range. And you know, a piece of it is to get slightly better uh, error ellipses by removing degeneracies. But we, a lot of us have been thinking about this as we want to really have a lot of control of systematics. Um, the other big plan survey is a bold survey. The idea here and we'll, is to complete the Kepler program um, by discovering through microlensing uh, lots of, of, of exoplanets, about 2,000. What, sorry? All of this combines about two years with the supernova and the spectroscopic survey. And sort of about, you know, of order a year here, a little bit longer than a year here, a little bit less than a year here. In terms of the, the deep surveys, this just gives you a sense of where we'll go and it's complementary territory to LSST. So we're looking at the point source sensitivity versus wavelength. LSST uh, goes to about 27th roughly. Uh, this is the 10 year sensitivities. Y is sort of weaker. Uh, Euclid is about a 24th. It's actually much better matched to things like DES. It'll actually complement that quite nicely. And we'll be here about comparable depths over those at that area. And uh, while we're planning to survey in these bands, we've actually now added some additional filters. Um, We've just added, um, this is new compared to things you'll see in the literature on it, um, a filter centered around 0.6 microns um, that will be, you know, after Hubble's gone, we'll have this wide field uh, a capability to survey um, in a band that I've been pushing that we call orange, because that's actually where it's centered. And there is no orange filter. And um, this way, we will honor our president. <laughs> um, in terms of just complementarity with LSST, this is just giving you a sense of things like photo Zs. When you add the infrared, you really gain a tremendous amount there. So I think it will, will really be, the combination of the two will really be very powerful. So you gave an acronym for where the uh, 2,000 where are they? Uh, well, it's not, it's not well, you know, fundamentally it's not decided, right? So the plan right now is we want to be away from the ecliptic plane. Um, right, right now what we've been designing to is a, and I just don't know if I have the slide with it on. 
a, um, it's a patch down in the south, but not all the way down south. It's, it's easily visible um, from all the Chilean sites, it's sort of overhead for Alma. But I think uh, a lot of us have been discussing moving a, cu a couple hundred square degrees to the north, so it's visible from northern telescopes. Um, the Japanese are very likely to come in as partners and provide 100 nights of Subaru time. And the thing that the Japanese, I think, will ask for as part of that is um, one, you know, at least 100 square degrees in the north. And uh, I think we'll, um, for our deep fields, we haven't, again, formalized anything, but we've been talking with our LSST colleagues about making sure the deep drilling fields of LSST overlap with the W first deep fields. And I think we want to have some fields in the north where they're basically Subaru deep fields, where we use Hyper Supreme Cam, which isn't, you know, doesn't have the area of LSST, but is in the north, it's still a pretty big camera, and also has narrow band filters. So it will let us do some things with a deep field overlapping with uh, with HSC. And that field in the north, I mean, um, the, the Zodi background is actually pretty significant in the infrared. So I think that makes the equatorial, you know, it'd be tempting to look at the equator where you can see from everywhere, but I, th that sort of drives us in terms uh, to probably looking at a field um, that's really a northern field and then really southern fields. Yeah, no, er everything you see from the southern field is, is easily visible from Atacama. It's sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's centered around a deck of about minus 20, minus 50. Yeah, I've already said this. Look at deep drilling fields. And then to get a sense of what range is covered in terms of the lensing, you know, we're looking with the supernova surveys of doing accurate distances to about redshift 1.7, 1.8. We have BAO measurements with H alpha. One of the nice things about this bigger telescope that uh, compared to the original thoughts here is we're much more sensitive to the um, going to higher redshift with oxygen lines. And the advantage here is uh, the emission regions are quite small. So this is something where you win as you know, diameter to the fourth power as you both get more signal and the noise goes down into the resolution. And that lets us get a pretty big sample out here. So we can do BAO over this whole region, do weak lensing distances, look at cluster growth. So there's a bunch of different redundant ways of going after this. In many ways, at least, you know, the strategy we're taking in terms of going deeper, I think is nicely complementary to plans for Euclid. So Euclid is looking at in this in terms of BAO density parameter, the number density of galaxies times the power spectrum measured at the BAO peak. You're basically cosmic variance limited at one for measuring the two-point function. Euclid's gone for the maximum area. We're going deeper, but, but the much bigger telescope. So we have many more objects over a wider redshift range, but we're actually, but we're covering less area. One of the things this opens up, and this is actually something I've been uh, starting to play with and learn more about is because we have these higher number density of galaxies, you can start doing things beyond the two-point function. Look at measuring three-point statistics and voids, and we've, we've now just starting to explore what we learned ab uh, about uh, voids with uh, measurements from W first. And this just compares with, uh, with Euclid. Actually, I'm running a little slow. Okay say a little bit about supernova. So the plan is to do a three-tiered survey for supernova covering low, medium, and high redshift. One of the things we're doing in the design for the supernova survey is we're worried a lot about calibration. And we have um, a program of having onboard calibrators um, pretty systematically um, studying things with some uh, precursor balloon flights to calibrate things. Um, you know, the, the goal is to really be, I mean, um, 
to work hard, you know, we're trying to identify the systematic errors and, and work hard on that. And uh, we have two very good supernova teams, um, which uh, leads us to have the benefit of the um, mutual wisdom of the combined teams, as they're both able to critique the different approaches. <laughs> Renee, isn't that a nice way of discussing that community? <laughs> Um, for measuring uh, W and W prime, you're, well, it's nice to get the Hubble constant in and of itself, um, but the, um, we're, when we're estimating parameters, we've been thinking about these as relative distances. And that's, you know, uh, the, those common, we've been including sort of these common mode uncertainties in the kind of Fisher matrix estimates of the, the distances. Renee. Sorry, to observe all the same tick fields, all of the LSST 10 tick No. Because one of the things we're finding with the, within the LSST supernova group is that there's actually not all of the tick fields are created equally for supernova. Like some, you, you just do worse in general. And I know we're going to make a, a LSST W first in its team. Right. Like, yeah, no, I, so. What we've been talking about with our LSST colleagues is not just looking at the same fields, but looking at them at the same time. And there's some data, I mean, it's an interest, there's a sort of a trade. There's some things to be said for if LSST goes deep on some fields, that we go to those quickly. Um, I think there's a lot, you know, we want, one of the many things we want to do with this include finding lots of interesting JWST and ELT targets and getting those soon. So, you know, if you have LSST deep drilling fields where a lot of the data is in hand during the first year of operation, and particularly with JWST where we don't know how long it will last, you want to basically identify, the, get to those fields, and identify them as quickly as possible. So now let me say a little bit about the, the GEO program. Um, we have about five or so different geo teams that have been developing uh, programs, you know, ranging really over the whole uh, redshift range. You know, looking from um, getting very large samples of high redshift galaxies to studying the, uh, our own galaxy. So in our own galaxy, we're looking at um, getting very accurate astrometry that will um, let us get estimates of dark matter for the uh, surrounding uh, uh, for the dwarf satellites. Um, one of the nice things we, ha we have already is the Gaia reference frame. And every W first image will have uh, several hundred Gaia stars across it. And that means you can look, say, just first for the lensing, if you have, say, coma across the field, the kind of coma that you worry about for a lensing observation, say a part in 10 to the 4, would be noticeable. Well, a part in 10 to the 4 coma across the W first field corresponds to a displacement of Gaia stars of something like a hundredth of an arc second systematically across the field. That's, that's enormous. So we'll be able, you know, for our lensing science to use the astrometry, but once we've tied down the, you know, the Zernike polynomials across the image, we can basically do relative astrometry relative to the Gaia data and also relative to the galaxies we observe. And we will not achieve the, I think, the systematic uncertainties of Gaia of getting down to the few micro arc second level measurements, but we will probably get to the, you know, 40 to 80 micro arc seconds about what we think our systematic flow will be for our imaging. But we get a lot more photons than Gaia. So that means once you get out to something that's, say, um, 17th, 18th magnitude, you'll do as well from W first. And then our floor extends out. So if you're interested in looking at 20th to 25th ma magnitude stars in our galaxy um, and doing interesting astrometry with it, this will be a nice step um, 
you know, for some of the things we want to do beyond Gaia. And, uh, you know, I think when we have more Gaia data, we'll know more about what we hope to do um, with this. But I, we've looked at some things like looking at tidal streams and having an imaging program of following the streams and looking pretty deeply down the main sequence as the kind of thing that, uh, uh, that will be, you know, I think good to do. And this is something where, um, you know, you basically right, you get M dwarfs out to the edge of the galaxy in terms of just imaging and, and doing astrometry. And, um, you know, while I think the LSST will be very powerful for many things, for doing this kind of accurate astrometric measurements, you're really going to be able to go in order of magnitude or two better just being in the space environment, which is just so stable. So you're going to be looking for probe stars? We should be able to, with these, at the time, it'll be a really nice multicolor database. So, um, we'll, we'll, pro, we'll go all the way to about K. That's our K short, actually, to be precise. Um, these are some estimates on um, just counts. So this is, you know, extrapolate, so with current sort of extrapolations of, uh, numbers of galaxies, you know, we should find hundreds of redshift uh, 10, 11, 12 galaxies, um, which will be, you know, I think, I think we'll do some awesome things with JWST. Um, people probably know this, but JWST has been delayed six months or on that topic. Yeah. Um, it's just to go off on that tangent briefly, there were three causes of the delay. It's, I was at NASA headquarters Friday, so uh, one is when they go, it's taken them longer to practice folding the uh, sun shield, and there's been delays associated with that. Um, uh, they've been, uh, some of the uh, ro uh, rockets they need for the inertial control on it have taken longer to deploy. And another cause is Bepi Colombo has moved into their launch window. And there's a very narrow range of launch windows that Bepi, this is the mission to Mercury that the ESA is launching, that they can use. And the combination of those things, um, they basically slipped into Bepi Colombo and they have to basically jump across to the other side, means they're looking at an April uh, 2019 launch as a likely launch. Um, this has. There's enough money in the budget reserves for the project to handle the delay to April 2019. So it's, uh, it's actually not caused a, um, a sense of crisis. And there's my, at least what I was told is that there's nothing catastrophic going wrong. It's just d delays as they go through a very complicated period of integration and test. All right, now let me turn to um, exoplanets. And W first will measure exoplanets in two ways, gravitational microlensing and coronography. So first, gravitational microlensing. Um, so here, so if I do this right, you can actually see some of the planet's lens as a star passes in front of them. And what you're seeing is you've got a background star a lens and a planet passes in front. The, the lensing star splits it and brightens the image. And when the planet passes through the Einstein ring, you get a blip. And you can determine it's the planet mass and its orbit by the duration and location of the blip. And this lets us probe down to really low masses and cover things from uh, Earth to uh, Earth's orbit from an AU out to the orbits of Neptune. Um, we'll have the sensitivity to get down to a few times the mass of the moon. Um, you'll really learn a lot about the statistical properties of these planets. And because we have a lot of precision in space, we will be able to not just get the lensing so event, we'll also, because of our L2 orbit, 
our position relative to the lens is changing during the duration of the lens, this sort of astrometric lensing effect means you know the distance to the source. So we'll be able to um, get you know, good statistics on these, these microlensing events. Um, here's just the raw numbers in terms of what we hope to do in terms of, uh, of imaging. Um, these are also excellent data for things like astroseismology, right? So we're going to have 75 million stars uh, with uh, 40,000 measurements per star and signal to noise of 100 on these sources. So you'll, uh, you'll be able to get uh, a tremendous amount of data there. Um, this is, I think, a nice way of just showing its complementarity to Kepler. This is a, a plot, uh, what we've come to call the Perry plot. Um, Ke this is what Kepler has seen. This is, of course, hypothetical data for W first. But you can see all of the planets of our solar system would be seen. And we would get statistics and get down to this very low mass range. And in terms of uh, getting good demographics of what's out there, uh, we'll do very well. We'll also be able to detect my favorites, which are these free-floating planets. So these are, there's ev we've seen some evidence for this from ground-based data. Um, this is not ground-based data. This is simulated W-first data showing a, a 23 sigma detection of a Mars-like free-floating planet. Um, when you think about this stuff, this is going to be, a, I think, a very interesting probe of the efficiency of planet formation. Because you know, if uh, planet formation is very efficient, you form very full systems, you'll kick out a lot of rogue planets. And, there should, and we will have measures of their mass and their distribution across the, the sky. So as a result, an effective measurement of their, uh, their metallicity. And um, we even will be sensitive to moons of free-floating planets. Um, when I think about what we do when we study systems of scientists, I like to think of we have sort of two approaches. One is we get lots of data on uh, individual systems. And the other is we get lot, uh, lots of poor quality data about many things. So the, I think of the microlensing as doing the demographic study. And then the detailed study is what we'll be doing with the coronagraphs. Um, the, one of the many things we learned from working on WFIRST is while this has a complex uh, pupil, we're able to design a coronagraph to work with a complex pupil, have made a lot of progress in our ability to detect things. Here are some simulations. This represents where we are now from the ground in terms of uh, GPI and uh, SphereX, um, where JWST near CAM and HST will be. And you can see we're sort of three orders of magnitude improvement in terms of where we expect to be with the coronagraphic instrument on W first. And we think we will have the sensitivities. These are known planets. So there's a, a series of known um, Neptune-like planets that we should be able to go after. If things work as well as we hope, we'll be able to go after some super-Earths. Um, we're still not quite yet at Earth. You know, we could get, get very lucky. So that's, there we go, we've gone there, we've taken that step, and the notion is that provides tr a lot of the background for going there. This is the same plot. Is the coronavirus good enough to see in a microlensing event by a star, the star that's doing the microlens? Depends on what the star is. But there will be, there will be a, a population. There will be a star. And in the program, the intention is to do that with the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. Oh, to see a microlensing. Oh, to follow up the. No. I don't, th I, th I actually don't know the numbers if they work. Because I think of the. Um, you know, most of the analyses of the microlensing um, has looked at, um, you know, the typical event is a kiloparsec away. 
Now, there's, there's enough of them. There's perhaps one or two at 100 parsecs where you have uh, an event that you might be able to see a, a chronographic follow-up. But I, 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 actually, I don't know if anyone's checked the numbers. It's an interesting question. And then it's important for developing the various technologies if we want to, you know, one of the things that we're you know, thinking about looking ahead, um, what will be one of the big discussions in, I believe, in the next decadal survey in the United States is what do we do next after these missions? And one of the possibilities out there is that we build a uh, large optical UV telescope optimized for studying exoplanets. People are talking about things as large as a 12 meter class optical telescope in space. If we are to do that, we will basically take advantage of the fact that we've developed most of the technologies that we need for uh, w, uh, for the, an, an Earth characterizing uh, sort of bigger mission um, with W first. Um, so I'm going to skip forward. I'm running late. Exozone imaging. So on the technology front, what's the status of the chronograph? It's quite ambitious. So the chronograph has actually passed all the milestones. Um, I'm going to skip to uh, that were uh, designed for phase A. So that, <laughs> but as we went through, we realized those were not sufficient. So we've met the tech. Um, so they've. Uh, we're, I think, in the lab, we have everything one needs to do t of order 10 to the minus 8. And they're working to push towards 10 to the minus 9. Yeah, but you're building something similar. So, uh, so it's not completely there yet. It's, it is not yet. A, uh, right now, we're in phase A. They'd like to be at TRL level 5 by phase B. They're on, they're on track to do it. So it's not. Um, it's, it's not all done. I mean, the chronograph is the hardest thing. Right? The camera, I think we know how to build. And the chronograph is moving along the way it's supposed to. Um, in some ways, I mean, we were working once towards a 2024 launch. It's now looking like 2026. That's actually made life easier for the chronograph. So the fact that the Congress and the President have not given us the budget profile we wanted um, has eased things up. I mean, I was one of the people pushing for a more rapid launch, and my chronograph colleagues were nervous that we would succeed. I think had we succeeded, it might have been, had we been working for a 24 launch, it would require that the technologies be complete by 2019 to 2020. And that, that'll be hard. Is there time for a starship? I'm glad you asked that question. So I figured I would use the last four minutes to talk about <laughs> starships. She was not planted. I decided to skip the, uh, some stuff to say a bit about this. So we are designing the mission to be starshade capable. And the notion will be if the decadal survey recommends launching a starshade as a separate mission, that we will be able to work with it. And then in the, you know, the subsequent five years of W first, it would operate with a starshade. What the starshade lets you do so the idea with the starshade is you fly something actually of this scale, about 40 meters across. Um, and um, you use that the same way you'd use your hand to block, block a bright light. <laughs> the separation is more like a megameter. This is not to scale. Um, deploying a structure that large is a well understood and solved problem. Google Lacrosse satellite in Wikipedia. It is used for other purposes. Um, and um, what needs to be developed and we're working on is things of this size have been used in the radio. They do not require the accuracy that we need. 
Um, so there are, we've been at JPL. Oops, does, the movie doesn't work. Ah, we have been building and now deploying um, star shades with the precision needed. It doesn't mean it's very scary. I mean, I see those are huge. Those are huge. Well, it's, these are big pedals. It's scary when they deploy because it makes a big noise. <laughs> and I was standing there and they said, don't stand there. The points are sharp. <laughs> so I moved a little bit away. Um, this distance is easy. You could be off by a kilometer. The relative spacing this way matters a lot. You have to do it to a meter. But there you've got a nice control loop. So what you do is the star shade um, doesn't block light in the mid-infrared very well. It leaks. It's just wavelength dependent. So you have a single a, a quad cube in the mid-infrared. If you're a little bit off, the quad cube picks up more light in this corner than that corner. And then you, uh, you send a signal back. So you need to be able to communicate with the satellite, and it shifts. So you've got, uh, you control that um, with some low, you know, uh, low, energy, uh, low thrust ion motor that steers that. So you and you have a control loop. The satellite or the starshade? The star, so you control the starshade. The star shade's lighter than the telescope. So you move the, right, so you, you, you move the star shade. Um, we also do that because we don't want to build the control system until we know we need it. So that becomes the responsibility of the star shade when it gets built to do that. We have to have the sensitivity to, contr to control, and we have to be able to signal to them. Are the odds of the deployment? Well, there's a question, what's the odds that the decadal survey recommends it? Who knows? Um, there have been many structures of this size deployed. Yes. So if it was just um, deploying this and nothing else, it's sort of, you know, with no tech development, it's like 100 million. But th the mission cost probably by the time you include, um, well, we've got to develop these technologies. We have to test this. We have to pay for a launch vehicle. You then have to play for five more years of W first operation, right, which is sort of 80 million a year, you know, paying people at Space Telescope. And um, one of the um, positive or negative features of a starshade is it takes a long time to steer from target to target. So more than 50% of the time, it's doing general astrophysics. So you're paying all those astronomers to reduce. That's why it's 80. So that's like half the cost almost is just operations. But so it's probably a billion dollar mission. So it would, it would be a, a, what people would call a probe class mission to, to fly that. I mean, that's half time when you're not shading anything. You just continue that big first science. Right. Like an HST. That's right. So it's, it's quite nice because you get, you know, you would, what I would like to do is co if it was, uh, uh, cover the entire sky, our high latitude sky at least, in a single band because that's just such a great archival data set to have. Um, so here's the current uh, political situation. It's uh, currently in phase A. Phase A has been stretched out a little bit. Um, oh, I should have updated this. This is, uh, right now we're um, in guides at 25 launch, slipping towards 26. We got 90 million in 2017 out of Congress. Um, we've got 120 million in the 2018 budget um, and a little more in the Senate bill. So we'll, we'll, I think we'll end up in that range. We actually have to ramp up to about 250 million the next year which is sort of the big step up in order to start building. Uh, this is all, the, you know, 90 million does, lets you design things. Space missions are expensive. Um, and uh, the plan is as JWST ramps down, we'll ramp up 
and uh, that will, will go forward. So this is all a work of a lot of people. This is um, the list just of, of the leadership of the science teams. Uh, and then this is all the selected members, not even focused enough. This is the, the, we have 207 members on the science investigation teams right now. And the plan would be, you know, these teams are helping to design formulation. Um, probably around 2020, we would recompete the teams. And these, the recompeted teams would play a significant role in selecting the next set of missions. Um, you know, I think there's a pretty reasonable chance that Canada will join as a partner that's moving forward. I think if that happens, what will be the opportunity is to join one of the competing teams in the you know 2019 2020 time frame, um, and uh, you know be be part of that mission. So I think that's something for people to think about. Look, you know, uh, looking forward as an opportunity. Um, okay, so why don't I stop here? Oh, there is the answer to Dick's question. Do you have any questions yet? Yeah. Momentous star shape, what would you be able to achieve? I mean, concept, whatever. 10 to the 10. Well, well, 10 to 10 are better, actually. Star shape, you, in principle, could block the whole star. So you can, um, you should be, and you can get to smaller uh, inner working angles. So a star shade should let you do Earths around the nearest star, uh, stuff within 10 parsecs. Some, the big question for the star shade on how far you can go is also things like Zodi. So it doesn't block the Zodi. So if the Zodi is brighter than the planet, um, remember we, we, have, we only have a 2.4 meter telescope. Um, if you're working at 2 lambda over d, uh, that means the size of your PSF is most of your, your disk. So you pick up a lot of zodiacal dust. You know, it's not a problem if we're typical. But you know, th there's a great deal of uncertainty on what the level of Zodi is. Um, that's something, by the way, we'll pin down really well. Right? So um, the fallback science, if we are limited in what the chronograph can do, is zodiacal is disks. You can do, you know, you, you still have a factor, you know, let's say you're only a hundred fold improvement over Hubble, then you, you, do, you do zodiacal dust this. You, you don't get to do planets. Does the, uh, is this still an IFU? That is a hard question to answer. Um, we, the current design has the IFU baseline. The project before going to phase B has an external review that just took place. The external review has reported to headquarters what it recommends. It probably has a recommendation on the IFU. The recommendations will be public October 19th. So, um, I can show you my text message from Saul Perlmutter from, and two missed phone calls. Saul's called me twice during this talk to talk to me about the IFU and what we need to do to make sure the IFU is still there. So, <laughs> better call Saul, right. Um, yeah, so I, uh, the, the IFU is certainly something that would be valuable to have. Um, we can probably carry out a, a very good supernova program without it. So once you say that to managers, it sounds like, oh, we need to save some money. This might be the thing to descope. On the other hand, if we can get significant foreign contribution, then it doesn't save any money, and we, it becomes something that we have. So it's it, uh, the. I, I think we'll have a recommendation coming out of this uh, panel. Um, what was clear from our discussions with the panel and with headquarters is a firm decision has to be made by February of 2018. Because after that point, 
it will co we, it'll cost us a lot of money to pull it, put it back in if we pull it out. And we won't, um, that's about, uh, because it's the point at which we send out for contracts with industry on the optical bench, um, that's, uh, there'll be a firm decision by that date. Okay, why don't we thank David again for a great talk.